Welcome to What's Going On, program designed especially for you. Number one, it's designed for you so that you can be informed and kept abreast to what's going on in this community and the surrounding area. And number two, so that you can actually become a part of this programming. And you can do that by three different ways, by calling in, uh, by tweeting, or through email. And that information is gonna be up on your screen. So welcome to what's going on. I got a distinguished guest with me this afternoon who is gonna share some of the things that she's doing in this community uh, to keep our young people from going down the wrong path. I'm talking about Reverend Dr. Janet Three Smith. She's a native of Chicago, Illinois. She has, she earned her PhD in education from Iowa State. She published, she's a published scholar, a researcher, and a former professor at the University of Missouri. She's licensed in or, and an ordained minister, associate minister at Columbia Second Missionary Baptist Church, and she's been a minister there for 10 years. She retired from the Department of Economic Development Workforce Development at the Career Center as a career counselor in 2012. And she's been the founder and the executive director for a non-for-profit organization entitled For His Glory Incorporated since 1999. Uh, Street Smith, yes. because she is recently married to uh, my previous guest, Mr. James Smith. <laughs> Welcome to what's going on, Miss Street Smith. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, you know, we were talking before the show started, and it was uh, one of the things that have really, really been impressed upon me is the fact that. Uh, like yourself, I'm a, a minister and uh, we have a jail ministry that goes to the Boone County Jail every Saturday. And we alternate. We have the, the, the women come out one Saturday and the men come out the next Saturday. Well, one of the things that we have found out, and it was through the jail staff, is that the fastest growing population at Boone County Jail is the young African-American females. And that uh, really, really impressed upon me that we need uh, to, to get this information out to the public because I think the public is not aware of this phenomenon. Another thing, I just got a call right before I came here from a young lady who is in the Missouri Department of Correction. She was with some young men, I think the earlier part of this year, when a another young man got killed out there in uh, the Conley Lane Walmart parking lot. And we're noticing more and more that these young women are being involved with these violent crimes. So for this particular show, I wanted to to bring someone on that is doing something in the community uh, because it was hard pressed for me to find someone that is actually working with young females mm. okay. to prevent them from uh, try to do the best to prevent them from going down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. So I called you up and I want to thank you okay. for accepting this mm. because I know you're a very busy lady, especially during this time. I know your program, this is uh, the most busiest time I would mm. do in a year. Mm. So thank you for coming on board. You're welcome. You're welcome. So my question to you is, okay, uh, just give me some type of idea of, first of all, who you are and secondly, what impressed upon you to create for his glory? Okay. Well, um, I represent uh, the type of girl that 
you may actually be observing in some of these uh, centers. Uh, but certain interventions occurred in my life that saw to it that I didn't take certain steps. Um, and therefore, this program, For His Glory, we have designed this to kind of replicate some of those community-based interventions that I and my uh, deceased husband, uh, Reverend Wesley G. Three, we experienced in Chicago that we felt made a difference. Would you elaborate a little bit more on, on that background that you said, uh, some of the particulars? Uh, you don't have to get intimate mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, give mm -hmm, too much mm -hmm, up, but mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. some of the characteristics that you said some of these young ladies uh, well, are experiencing. In, in my own life, um, I, I went to 14 grammar schools before the eighth grade. So that meant my mother was very mobile. Yeah, transit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I might be in a school a couple of months. Um, and, and that's one of the symptoms of poverty, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah. Um, there, uh, it, took, it wasn't until college that I think I started trying to deal with uh, my own temper. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say it really wasn't until I got married last year that I've actually been able to manage it, control it. Um, what I see in our little girls, I see myself because uh, they learn very quickly in this kind of uh, society where you're moving around, you don't know people, you don't know who to trust. Uh, you become very aware of your own vulnerabilities as a female. Um, you can be preyed upon by other females as well as by males. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to be pretty rough. You learn to have a lot of mouth to keep people off of you. And if necessary, you can back it up physically mm. to keep people off of you. So it's a protective me mechanism for girls. So they, they, they build up this, this hard shell and this persona that I am rough, I am tough. Don't mess with me. Mm, mm -hmm. okay. And then when that gets challenged, you've got to back it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have to learn to fight well, uh, or if you're not a good fighter, you better learn how to cut. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in Chicago during the Blackstone Ranger terrorism time. And Blackstone um, Ranger is for a some gang. A gang, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a, a very powerful gang in, in Chicago. And uh, they were being very aggressive and very assertive uh, in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, terrorizing entire neighborhoods. Boundary lines were being firmly set by shooting in the buses, uh, attacking kids, walking down the street across uh, neighborhood boundaries. The school boundaries differed from the neighborhood boundaries, so kids weren't. It, you know, it just was a bad time. Mm. And I remember my freshman year being attacked in school uh, by a group of girls, the Rangerettes. Um, and it was a very difficult experience. Um, and so it doesn't benefit you as a female to be too soft okay. in, in these kind of neighborhoods. So that's, that's a part of that survival mm -hmm. uh, tactics that you mm -hmm. got to in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And then when you're dealing with the female uh, nature, which is an emotional nature anyhow, um, the girls during that gang time, uh, every day we'd come to school and there were different stories about what had happened to this girl or that girl. Um, and they'd pick out girls, you know, light-skinned girl, long haired girls, long-legged girls, heavy-set girls. They just pick out ones that they wanted to get to. And uh, the catchphrase by the time I graduated from high school was, you don't see any cuts in my face. Mm. Because if they got you, they cut you. So that everybody would know that the gang has already got to you, so no, don't mess with them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point was, can you get out of high school without your face getting cut. You know what, and that's, that's very interesting because it seemed like either history is repeating yes. itself. 
uh, because you bring it up to the Bloods and the mm -hmm. Crips, and now we got these new, mm -hmm. uh, new gangs that, mm -hmm. and especially when we bring it to local, uh, there are some gangs that we have become aware of, mm -hmm. and and one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing as the director of the Youth Empowerment Zone that some of these females are being pressured mm -hmm. into trying to, uh, to become a gang member or to become, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, something that these male gangs can use? Well, they, they are a community. They're forming a community. And within any community, you're going to have your males and your females because you've got to have people. Bottom line, the human nature is everybody wants to be loved. Yes. So, you know, if you're a gang guy, you want a gang girl because mm -hmm. you don't want to fall asleep and she cut you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you want somebody that you feel is on your team yeah. and that knows how the team operates. Well, you know, that's interesting you brought that up because uh, my staff and myself, last summer we went to a gang prevention and youth violence prevention uh, training in Chicago. And what we learned that the number one recruiting tool for most of these young people that they recruit for gangs is the sense of belonging mm -hmm. to a family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said because most of them come from broken homes, mm -hmm. broken families, some of the things that mm -hmm. you mentioned that mm -hmm. you went through mm -hmm. uh, because of that poverty situation and the, and the, and, and the breakdown of the family mm -hmm. structure, they said, most of these kids are just looking to belong and to be loved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even though what the gangs is bringing is a perverted love, the kids still receive it as, I got some folks who love me. They got my back. And I, I have a sense that within those communities, there is uh, dependability, there is reliability, somebody having your back. Um, there's sociability. Mm -hmm. um, I think these communities provide what any other community uh, is trying to provide. Church community, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, they're all trying to provide that. It's the focus of the activity by these groups that makes it adverse. That is good because you are absolutely right because those are, are the things that's missing uh, out of these kids' life that a normal, quote-unquote, middle-class, two-parent kid get in their household, mm -hmm. and these are these sub-communities, they are the ones that coming along mm -hmm. to, to provide what, you permiss uh, what they're missing. But mm -hmm. like you said, it's just the activities that makes them uh, terrible. Right, the focus of the activity that that group is doing compared to, say, a Boy Scout, Girl Scout group where the focus is selling cookies, you know, having a business as, you know, teaching little girls how to be business women or teaching boys how to be future soldiers or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the focus that's different. But all of these groups are offering these young people the same thing in terms of love, belonging, responsibility, dependability. That's good. And with that in mind, uh, if you wanna if you wanna participate into this conversation, or you got something to add, up on the screen you will find the method in which you can do that, either through Twitter, uh, email, uh, and we even got a Facebook page. But you can you can chime in through those means. Uh, Dr. S Three Smith. Uh, Tell me about F For His Glory. What motivated you okay. to, to create that? And what is motivating you to direct it and continue with it? Well, when I was a professor at MU, my research was looking at why 10% um, of the African-American population pretty much since the time of W.B. Du Bois when they first developed the theory of the talented 10th. Mm -hmm. Why that seemed to be holding consistently true across decades. Mm -hmm. That 
10% of African American population was becoming college educated, which meant 90% of the population was not. Right. And when I checked the statistics, it didn't seem to waver. Uh, it was as though there was some uh, limit and we never went over it. So when I looked at the data uh, pre-World War II, post-World War II, the establishment of black colleges, uh, post uh, President Johnson's uh, opening up uh, the opportunity for uh, financial aid and tuition mm -hmm. to women and minorities. Um, somehow that 10% seemed to hold in place. And I was intrigued by that. Um, and so then uh, when I began to explore what makes this 10% different than uh, the rest of the population. 90%. 90% different than the rest of the population. Um, I found that uh, generally there was a critical event that had occurred in the young man or the young woman's life that made them make a personal decision uh, that they were gonna go to college and they were gonna finish. Mm -hmm. um, Prior to uh, Johnson's time, when the uh, opportunity for African Americans to go to white colleges was not so prevalent, mm -hmm. um, it was uh, for the benefit of the race that young people made the decision to go to college okay. um, because they wanted to help their people as a race. Uh, it, a lot of our older doctors and lawyers were not motivated by how much money can I make, but how can I go into this profession and then overall help our people. Right. But once uh, the uh, opportunity for uh, money was put in, the National Defense Student Loan was one that I got uh, an opportunity to use, um, white schools, what, the, what became known as PWI, predominantly white institutions, mm -hmm. began to recruit African Americans to come to their campuses and offered uh, phenomenal financial aid packages. Um, and so the end result is you, you had this population of people who were able to respond to what came later, which was known as affirmative action. Okay. They got the education and then they were able to get the jobs um, and a lot of decisions that affirmative action helped to overcome were uh, decisions that had to do with comfortability, familiarity, uh, cultural similarity. Affirmative action was able to bring uh, some of these walls down that prevented African Americans from moving in. Mm -hmm. um, it's racism. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and and the reason I don't just blatantly say yes, racism. Um, looking back over my life now, the it's been 40 years. I left college. I went to a PWI. I left college at 21 and uh, retired basically in 40 years. Um, and when I look at that whole history, I'm not so sure that difficulties I had was based just on the color of my skin. The difficulties, I think, had a lot more to do with the fact that I was just different. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know anything about your culture. They don't know anything about your habits. And so they're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and so then if you take a young person who's from the street mm -hmm. and has learned the culture of the street and give them a college education, and then put them in middle America, corporate America, professional business America, which has nothing to do with the street, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of dissonance, okay. well, disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I don't just blatantly say it's racism. Oh no, it's isms. It's, yeah, it's a Ism. bunch of isms. Yeah. So our young Sexism. people, exactly, so our young people today from what I can see, we grew up on Leave it to Beaver, Bonanza. Oh, you really dating yourself, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, where all these programs were these white hero, male, female, uh, 
Barbara Stanwyck, whatever her name was, in the big valley, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But we grew up watching this stuff. Whereas today, today's kids um, are just the opposite. They don't see race or color. Mm -hmm. They see who's got the money and who doesn't. Now that's interesting because one of the things, uh, and I've been writing this, that uh, uh, the thing about this whole hip hop uh, genre, one of the things that I do admire about it is the fact that it have broke down some of those walls that you was mentioning uh, because you see it uh, all different nationalities and races are embracing it. Uh, and as you said, they don't see color. Uh, you see just as big uh, white hip hop audi audits, audience, uh, well, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. as well, female, all of them. Mm -hmm. And they have embraced this, this culture. Well, I have a theory on that too. <laughs> um, when I was in college, I wanted to drop out. I was so frustrated. And so the people who were sponsoring me and mentoring me to get through the education process decided that it would not be good for me to return to the community without finishing my education. So they raised money for me to go to France. Oh, really? To go to school in another country. And that was the most life-changing eight months of my life. Wow. I left in January and I came back in August and the entire world had changed. Wow. What I had found out in 1972 is that what I thought was my culture was actually marketing. Hmm. Um, and when I went to the freshman mixer, when I got back, I'm a senior, I went to the freshman mixer, it was hilarious to have students who did not know me from the previous year say, oh, are you from another country? Um, are you not American? Um, because I totally missed the black exploitation, uh, the arrival of that. Hmm. So I didn't know who Superfly was. I didn't know about platform shoes. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't get the beat of the music because I hadn't been enculturated into it. Um, I had a young man explain to me that these black velvet things with the neon light painting was our, our, our people's art. art. And I'm like, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this before, ever. Uh -huh. um, and so that's when I became aware that a lot of things we claim as our culture has to do with marketing. I got to see it again in 2010 when I went to China. And when I saw the young people of China, um, hair cuts at an angle, half of it dyed pink, half of it dyed green, uh, sagging, the long chain in the pocket, all the kids mm -hmm. on the little machines, the little girls wearing the little mini skirts and the hoodies. And then I went in the department stores. Mm -hmm. If you pull the faces of the people out, that department store could have been in Nebraska. Or anywhere. It could have been anywhere. Because everything hanging in there from the bras, the makeup, the lotions, the perfumes, the black leather jackets, that's when I realized that if I have to produce a good, I don't want to just sell it to you in the hood. Right. I want to sell it all over the world. That's excellent. Well, we're, we're about up with our time, and I just want to uh, let you know, because we, we really didn't get to where <laughs> we, we were trying to go. We didn't get to my program. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm going to be, because uh, I love this, and I think that the people did get, uh, get some meat out of this, this, this conversation, and what we're going to do is um, uh, just make this the, the prelude. Okay. So yeah, because I want to tell you what we're doing locally to overcome some of the differences and adversities that young people in Colombia, young females in Colombia are experiencing. Okay. And I have a track record now, 14, 15 years of evidence that we're doing it well. So I'm, uh, I'm going to invite you back. Still six minutes. Oh, we got six minutes. 
Okay, let me use that little time to tell you. Okay. I have I have two programs. We have an after school tutoring program and what we're doing, this is a replication of what I experienced in Chicago. Uh, young white people from the suburbs would come into the inner city and they would tutor us. Um, and they filled in the gaps of what the school couldn't give us. Mm -hmm. The school didn't have the time to work with us one on one. They didn't have the time to pause on that one thing we couldn't get. They had to keep moving on. Mm -hmm. And so our program does that. We work with young people who sign into our tutoring and we work with them one on one. We identify where are you stuck and we're going to work with you on that one thing you're stuck on until you get it and then we move to the next thing. Through that we're building confidence and this summer we're even moving kids ahead. We've got eighth graders already doing algebra. So when they hit algebra next year in high school, they're ready. Okay. And we want to build on that. We want to begin to have pre-everything through our program so our students are stepping in and can say, I've read the book, I know how to outline it, I know those big words and definitions, and I got the methodology. So that they're not trying to come from so far behind. Um, it's embedded in the school system that homework is a part of the academic development. But if your parents are unable to assist you with homework and the school doesn't have enough time in the day to help you with homework, then you will not catch up and you will not excel. You have to have help. So we provide that help. The second program I have is um, a program basically for girls. We call it a worship arts and dance academy. We teach young girls how to dance and embedded under that is, you know, how to walk, how to dress, uh, how to present. Um, we travel, we're, they're a traveling team. They have to train for one to two years to qualify for the team. And that then gives them an exposure larger than Columbia. Um, they then can see how the world and cultures differ and can begin to make comparisons. Um, we teach manners, courtesies, and then we find out the things that are troubling these girls and we address it. We have found out that we attract a lot of young ladies who do not have fathers mm -hmm. or who might even be only single daughters. Uh, there's no other girls in the family. Um, and so we address those issues. Okay. Well, that's a, in a nutshell. <laughs> In the nutshell, that's the two programs. And I know that you, you hit on some very, very, very key points that we do, uh, that we're focusing on at the Youth Empowerment Zone. And that's the reason why we, we want to partner and continue to partner with For His Glory. It's because we understand that education is probably the number one vehicle out of poverty. And you guys are, are on it. We understand that our children need discipline mm -hmm. and with your dance and that, mm -hmm. the routine, right. it teaches discipline. Yes, it does. And we understand that our children need for us to help them build up self-esteem. Yes. And that's something that we you do that. excellently. Yes. Yes. Those young ladies come out and they go in shy. Mm -hmm. They go in with a, such a low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that sometimes the way they act, uh, low self-esteem can be act out as being tough mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and that's just a symptom of low yeah. self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to commend you on the excellent job that you're doing with Thank these young you. ladies and the young men that's into your tutoring program. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I'm going to give you an open invitation that we will try to get you back here to okay. kind of finish this conversation because I, I love picking your brain. You're, <laughs> you're just a wealth of a uh, plethora of knowledge. Yeah, I didn't even know I was going down that road, <laughs> <laughs> the historical road. So I want to I want to thank everyone for tuning in to uh, what's going on. Again, this show it, it happens every month. The first Tuesday every month, and uh, we are just gonna be opening up uh, this fall. We're definitely gonna have the studio prepared to get some of you guys here. We want it to be an interaction where you guys can be here in the studio and asking Dr. Three Smith questions and picking our brains. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, you can always catch this program throughout this month. And that information will be up on your screen also. Uh, the times that the, the airing of the show, uh, the days of the week, and so forth. But thank you for tuning in. 
we want you to always know that we love you and there's nothing that you can do about that. And we're going to keep you, keep you abreast to what's going on.